Welcome back to the Beat the Often Path podcast, the podcast where we showcase unusual success stories to help us all think outside the box during these crazy times. My guest today is John Vong, an SEO company owner in Canada. For those of you who don't know, SEO is Search Engine Optimization. It's a digital marketing company that he founded. Now, he worked in sales for many years before making the leap to business owner, starting a company and learning as he went. This story is so relevant to anyone looking to start a business, especially if they're unsure of the next steps to take. There's so much inspiration in here and practical advice that I know you'll appreciate. So here's John Vong. John Vong, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing fabulous. Thank you for asking. Uh, the weather is not the greatest here in Toronto, Canada, yeah. but um, I'm fortunate to be living in a great, peaceful country that is very inclusive. And uh, I'm just fortunate and grateful to be happy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You hear that a lot from people who live in Canada, so I guess there must be a trend. <laughs> Maybe yeah, one there's day a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of good in um, you know diversity, right? Like we have good culture, great humans, like people respect each other, people understand different perspectives, different cultures, and that's what it embodies in people, right? Like we have huge communities that support one another, and that's what I love about it. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I've only visited the West Coast, but I would love to get over oh, yeah. to that side. I love Vancouver, Bouchard Gardens, all it. of those things. Amazing stuff. Oh, yeah. I love West Coast. It's uh, the vibe, very similar to where you are. Mm -hmm. Like the coastal vibe. Mm -hmm. People are just slower paced, enjoy living presently, and just it, it's comfortable living, I would say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, that's that's what you hear, you know. But yeah, I, I wanted to... So the reason that I wanted to have you on this podcast is because I think your story is very fascinating. So let me give you a little bit of background about what we do. My podcast is about unusual success stories. So the title is Beat the Often Path. Basically, helping people think outside the box uh, with unusual paths towards success. So I'm trying to find people who have atypical ideas or who tried one thing and then maybe tried another thing, which is your case. So I, I thought that, you know, what, what is something that's practical? A lot of people are thinking about switching careers right now. A lot of people are wondering what they should do next, or maybe they've been laid off, or they're in a new remote world, but they're not quite sure how to deal with it. So with all of these variables that are happening right now, I thought your story would be very interesting to share. So maybe if you could just give us the overview of a little bit about your path, your career so far. Yeah, definitely. Um, just to give you a nutshell, eight years ago, I started a digital agency called Local SEO Search um, in Toronto, Canada. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, um, my path to, I guess, business ownership was um, I, I was doing advertising sales for 10 years. So um, outside, just finishing university, I got my business finance degree. And then my first job was a sales career job. And it was to pay down the debt, student loan that I had. So just like um, most people in U.S., Canada, you're burdened, right? Like you have to pay down and survive. So you got to be, you know, good with your number finances, uh, understanding all your revenue or salary, money in, money out, and make sure you put things away so that you can move further ahead in life. Um, so that's what I did. I got a, a, to learn how to sell. So I took a lot of courses on like Zig Ziglar's, Brian Tracy's, absorbing as much content as I can. And this is before, um, you know, blogging and YouTube and videos came out and podcasts. This was like audio tapes. Wow. I don't know if a lot of listeners <laughs> had that, but, uh, you know, CD, Disman, Like MP3 Earl player. Nightingale on vinyl. <laughs> yeah. <it's Earl laughs> Nightingale. Um, so all those, and then going to the actual conferences wow. to see them speak in person, learning and absorbing as much content. And then um, just learning from great salespeople within organizations I was part of. So during those times, I was just following the, the habits of people, their daily structure, their daily nuances and how they position, talk to people, how they interact with others, just the usual behaviors, but I'm always listening and watching and observing, right? Sure. And the more I was doing that, and then I was at a point where now I was selling, you know, directory advertising at Yellow Pages, meeting thousands of the business owners that 
I came to then really fall in love with in terms of their aspiration of why they became business owners mm -hmm. resonated with me completely to then form my own company. Mm. Um, so those business owners were like hour long mentor sessions mm. on a daily basis. And I was having six of them a day. Wow. Right. Just asking questions on why they became who they are, what made them uh, do what they do with the same passion and purpose that they have been doing for many, many years, right? Like, and most of the, the time, most of these people were just telling me they, they loved the community. They were supporting their family. They wanted to just do something that served a purpose, which was adding value to other people's lives. So it was all about giving Right. It's never about like, I need to earn X amount to buy a nice car to go to all these trips. Nothing like that. It was more about helping others, right? Mm -hmm. Giving to others. Mm -hmm. So that's why I decided to start this agency. Didn't know anything about SEO. Okay. I had no technical background. I'm a sales rep, right? Right. So my background was working with these business owners. I found there was a gap in the marketplace. People were spending more than ever in traditional advertising, frustrated, not getting good ROI. Users' behavior was shifting to digital. And with digital came a lot of different formats, social media, email, you know, paid ads, contextual affiliate, you name it. And I gravitated towards SEO because I, I felt that was the hardest, challenging, and right. it was always going to keep me on my toes. Right. Like continually growing and yes. never stagnant. It's not like a one-time set and fix. It's like always changing. Sure. Uh, so that's what I've been on this path ever since uh, to fill that gap in the marketplace to help small business owners to become dominant players in their niche local community and um, dominate their SERPs. Mm -hmm. So uh, a couple things for the people who don't know. Um, I do SEO as well. It's one of the things I do have a marketing agency myself. Um, for people who don't know, SEO is search engine optimization. And largely when we're talking about that, like the books to your upper right <laughs> show, we're talking about Google 99% of the time because they are the dominant search player. So search engine optimization is how do people show up or not show up in the search results? So when somebody types... I need a haircut in Manhattan. Somebody's going to show up in that first position. And that's what SEO is, helping businesses get higher in Google rankings. Um, I'm interested in that you specifically targeted, you said, local SEO. So maybe give us a little bit of insight into that for our listeners. Yeah, so the, the reason I called myself local SEO yeah. search was I, I really focused on the small, medium-sized business owners. They resonated with me so much in, at Yellow Pages, right? Right. Those business owners were the foundation of every single neighborhood, community. And they were the bricks and mortar pizza shop, restaurant owner, you know, physiotherapist, dentist, right? Those guys worked crazy hours, did what they loved, and they did it for the family, right? And for me, that's why I called myself that. And most 80% of my business is the local small and medium-sized business owners, service-based typically, that really are the bread and butter of every single community, right? 20% uh, is more global, national in scope, like they want to dominate everything. But I love connecting with those hardworking individuals because that's a part of me, hmm. right? Yep. Well, there's two things that I kind of want to dive into there. Uh, the first one is you said you had zero technical skills and you got into a technical field. So that right there is fascinating. So maybe explain how did you actually begin? So you say, okay, there's a gap. It's a technical thing. I want to get involved. I know nothing about it. I've learned a lot. How did you actually start this business? Uh, yeah, so... I made a lot of mistakes early days, but my strength was sales. So I went there, out there and sold. I got like 10 clients in like a month or two, right? Like I was good at listening, asking questions, knowing, understanding the gaps, probing, and then uncovering what I discovered and offering a product or service that met their gaps and people were paying me. Mm -hmm. So I had money, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I just had to fulfill, right? So I knew I could sell. Yep. I just didn't know how to produce the results for these clients. So I was absorbing so much content at that time, reading blogs, staying up crazy hours, going to conferences, really just 
absorbing videos and reading and reading, trying to uncover like terminology, what I needed to do, how this actually worked. Like it was stressful because I was putting in 16, 18 hour days. Mm -hmm. I didn't have, you know, children at that time. I, I was, it was me and the business, right? So timing was a lot of it. And I had support from my wife to try something new and not be stuck in something that I know I would be frustrated in, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I think that is also very important when you're starting a business. You need that solid foundation of knowing, you know, there's comfort, but there's also that risk, mm -hmm. right? And people that support and are along the journey with you uh, versus someone that is always going to, you know, have negative cognition and people that are just toxic in nature, right? Like you want to just gravitate with, positivity. And that's why mentors and coaches and community is so important when you're on this journey. Mm. So you're doing it all yourself, sales and fulfillment, everything, everything, you're everything. servicing and 10 clients at the same time yourself to start. Yeah, trying to do everything. Okay, content writing, SEO, link building, yeah. you name it, right, just trying to do everything. Um, customer service, billing account. So then I started hiring people. I yep. made so many mistakes during that time too, because I've never hired people. Okay. And then I had to figure out where my gaps were, right? Like I needed an SEO strategist. I needed a content manager. I needed link builders, social media. Just everything started coming in once I started hiring good quality people mm. uh, with my team. So I fired a lot. I hired a lot. I fired a lot. I just kept doing this. And yep. at least I was in it. And the big thing was I was not afraid of you know, failure yep. because I already came this far, right? And then it was more about being genuine and authentic along the entire course of this journey. So early days, I was telling people I'm new. Huh. I don't really know what I'm doing, <laughs> but that's why the price reflects it. Okay. Right. And also, again, like when you charge a lot more, then they expect a lot more. Sure. So what so, what uh, were you charging, if you don't mind me asking? What was the typical rate in those days? At the at that time, I just felt I didn't deserve a lot because I didn't yeah. know. A lot. Yeah, I think at that time I was like doing five hundred dollars a month or okay. something. Basically, like yeah. it wasn't a lot, but yep. it, it paid for people and my software and all that. Stuff, right, right, right. All the tools. Uh, I didn't really pay myself at the beginning because okay. I I didn't think I deserved to pay myself because <laughs> yeah. I didn't know what I was doing yet. <laughs> Um, so this is like the struggles you have when you start growing an agency, right? Like mm -hmm. you got to figure out traction and when you should start charging a little bit more mm -hmm. and how to be perceived because once you start getting good solid results, then you can start raising your rates because you have some proof, right? right? Case studies, testimonials, right. white papers, etc. But at the beginning, it's all on like your hearsay. It's like what you sell. And right. selling it on your website is different than someone third party saying that you've done great work. Yep, absolutely. Well, that is uh, that's yeah. super interesting right there. Um, there's so much to dive into there. Uh, so the sales. Now, what when you what did you learn in terms of sale? What was your approach to selling to these people? The service that you didn't know that you could fulfill. How did you tackle well, that? Like sales for me uh, has always been a lot of fun, right? Okay. Like I take it on like, I don't know that person, new business owner, but I know there's a need in the marketplace. And yeah. I know that most people who have a problem, they want someone to help them solve it, but they don't know who to turn to, who to trust. Yep. So it's the relationship piece. And the more you connect with them on a, you know, personal level, like they want to do business with someone that they can relate to that knows their problems, mm -hmm. that understands their perspective, right? And how to run a business. And they can relate about, you know, where they're at in their journey, their business, their niche, their industry, and personal life as well, right? They, they're on the same kind of journey and path. Yep. And the more you connect with people in that level, then it becomes a lot easier to, you know, do things that they can trust you on doing right mm -hmm. and so that was my my strength really to uncover and let people talk all day long and i'm pulling and extracting probing uh open-ended questions and jotting down all their pain points and problems and then putting together a, a solution which is my presentation deck 
on this is what I can help you with based on our conversation. And it hits all in the nail, all their major pain points, right? Right. And that's how I sold. I was like, look, we can resolve all these issues if you work with us because this is this is what we're gonna do. Yeah. And eventually you just focus on what you do best, right? Which is running your business. And yet you were doing that, but you didn't know whether you could actually do that. <laughs> so you're like, well, we I was reading all, all these books these points, and blogs. But I was reading sure. these books and blogs In letting theory. me know what I need to do. Okay. Then I gotta figure yeah. out how to do it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, okay, so there's another interesting thing here. When you're dealing with SEO, it's a changing game. For those who don't know anything about it, Google changes their algorithms. It's a constantly changing game. It's also competition. You know, everybody wants to be the number one search result. So getting to number one doesn't mean that you're there forever. There's always this flux where somebody else is trying to do all the stuff that you're doing. There, and some terms are obviously way more competitive than other terms. Um, so, and it's a zero sum game. So there can only be one first position and the drop off from first to 10th and from the first page to the second page is tremendous in terms of traffic links, clicked all of that. So knowing that you need to get people to the top, but not knowing how you were going to do it. Um, how, how did you first approach the idea with your clients of, First of all, timeline. What exactly did you promise them? I'm curious. Oh, at the beginning, I was reading all these books yeah. and they were saying like three to six months, right? Okay. Yep. And I don't know if that was realistic or not. Yep. Um, I was just telling people that and and I, I just basically just told them the truth. Like, I'm going to work my butt off to ensure that I can try my best. I didn't guarantee anything, Yep. but... Um, based on what I learned, <laughs> that's what it should come out of it. Yep. And then sometimes it worked a lot quicker. Sometimes it, it took a lot longer. And so then you have to reflect and figure out like based on competition, niche, industry, market, uh, community, you know, keyword volume, high, high competition. There's all, all these other factors, right? Yep. Um, and benchmarking it based on who the major competitors are and figure out like where the gaps and opportunity. Now I know so much more after eight years. Of course. With all the tool set, all the knowledge, all the daily grind of doing it versus when I first started. Like terminology was difficult for me, mm -hmm. right? Understanding how a backlink really affects a website to then, you know, the structure of the schema markup or sitemap and all that stuff. Yep. A lot of people don't even get it now. Um, true. Unless you're in it, right? That's I, true. I've done so many business websites. Now I feel so confident yep. that I know a little bit more than what I did when I first started eight years ago. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So in terms of outreach, what was your preferred method for finding new clients and reaching them? Oh, at the beginning, it was just walking in my neighborhood okay. and pitching myself, cool. right? Um, because people want to do business with people they can relate to, right? Okay. Uh, and connect with. Uh, so you're going door to door. So you're, oh, yes. it was all physical. And, th and that's interesting because the majority of people in a digital profession are sending out emails to LinkedIn. I know this because I get 400,000 of the exact same follower or friend requests on LinkedIn every single day, <laughs> which gets pretty tiresome. So you I, I go think, in person. Yeah, yeah. The, what I found when I first started and probably works today more so than ever is genuine relationships. Mm -hmm. People are so uh, disconnected online, mm -hmm. email, phone calls, social media. They just want a real connection with yep. someone that they can see, yep. touch, have a normal conversation with yes. and know that they're real yep. versus a, a bot automation. Yep. And someone in a foreign country or something that they can't really relate to True. and know the language, know the, you know, the, the area, the community. How can they serve them well? Mm -hmm. if they don't even know, live here, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I found to work the best. And yes, it is. It was a grind early because I was spending so much time doing everything. But it was definitely worth it at the beginning. Okay. And, and who were your first hires and what order? Uh, first, uh, first hire was SEO. Okay. So <laughs> I didn't really know job. SEO. <laughs> Buddy. Because I was like, I'm frustrated. Get I'm reading results. this. Yeah. Help, speed up time. Help me like okay. uncover what the heck am I reading and what, what and does it mean? <laughs> is this a local person or is this, did you outsource Upwork or how did you find this person? Yeah. At the beginning, it was Upwork okay. because of my cost. Yep. 
Yep. Um, and then I found, you know, more senior people yep. because they have like five, 10 years experience in sure. different, different agencies. So I was looking at people that had global agency experience in London, New York, or someone that has a solid track record, right? Yes. That kind of knows what they're doing. So I can proof it, right? With some references. Um, and then from there is more about developer to actually do the work. <laughs> so that was my second hire. Same thing, Upwork, and then making sure they have a solid track record with a portfolio and stuff. Um, then the, the next is like content writers, link builders, everything else. Yep. So it took some time to hire and fire throughout the entire time because I made a lot of mistakes. Sure. Upwork is a, a whole marketplace. Oh, and yeah. It's hard to figure it out. Um, because you're going to get bombarded with all these resumes. And if you've never hired anyone, mm -hmm. a lot of work <laughs> to figure yeah. out, interview them, vet them, yep. go through a personality, I guess, or not. And then, because you're not there in person, you don't know if they're saying the truth or not, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. You don't know if they're smart or not. A lot of it is copy and paste. They could steal exactly. copy and paste. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. Well, that's so. So you did it one by one. So you you hired. You didn't hire like five people at once. You just said, okay, first I'm gonna do this. Um, did you specialize in terms of uh, the back end? Did you say I'm only going to work with Shopify people or WordPress, or did you d not do any of that? So just to give you a perspective as well, I bootstrapped everything. Okay. So everything was like I didn't get funded. It was like mm -hmm. I had no savings too. Like. I just got married, moved into a place. Mm -hmm. I was starting from scratch again. Mm -hmm. um, but I left a decent career, like six-figure sales job to now do something that I think I had an ability to kind of create something. Um, and then in terms of my, my vertical, my experience was yellow pages type clients, business owner, family run, service based. That's what pushed me to just be like them, like help those people, my my core, right? So then I, I kind of learned like what I really can help people. Like over the years, I got better. And now I work with more professional services mm -hmm. because they can, you know, they spend 20 years in their profession, dentists, lawyers, chiro, physio, you know, massage, whatever it is, right? And, or trades, they do that. 20 years of education, apprentice, working under someone, then building and starting their own business through a loan or bootstrapping it, that takes like them to maybe 40 years old, right? And they spent so much time to build up to that stage. They want to now shrink time and they understand what an expert should be doing. Just like them being an expert of 20 years, now they don't mind paying an expert. Mm. So that's now where you feel like that's where I am right now. Okay. I feel like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> A little bit more than when I first started. Yes. Uh, but it yes. took eight years to do that. Yes. Yes. And at this point, eight years in, any regrets at all? Or are you say completely happy I made the shift? I am so grateful for the cool. change and shift. Um, yes, early days, first three years was so stressful. Um, but it, it was a lifestyle choice for me because I knew if I wanted a family, I wanted to free up my time to be home, present, and doing things <laughs> I love doing. Yeah. Um, so yes, because if, the, the options I had when I left was I could go and try to sell Google ads at Google, right? Or Facebook or any of these major, you know, digital agencies or affiliate performance space. But if I wanted to try something and if my wife supported me, I was like, I'm going to do it. Like, mm -hmm. that's me, right? So mm -hmm. I gave it a shot and I enjoyed it. It was struggling. It was hard. But now, then I started hiring, you know, sales rep, operations, social media managers, content managers, everyone to oversee people. And then I feel like once you start having these layers of people that understand how to take care of their own, you know, team, then you have a lot less stress. Yeah. Um, because now I just focus on managing the managers. Yeah. Right. With their metrics and core uh, KPIs. Well, that brings me to an interesting question. Okay, so at this point, eight years in, what's your day-to-day -day like on a typical work day? Uh, I think it's changed with the pandemic. Sure. Um, but for me, it's I, I wake up at 5 a.m., 4.30 to 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, drink coffee or tea or <laughs> yeah. water, hot water or whatever, MCT oil, Bulletproof. Okay. Um, 
I read, I meditate. So that's when I get a lot of my absorbing of content that interests, hobbies or anything business related or lifestyle, whatever it is. Get it out of the way before I start making my breakfast for my family at seven or eight and usually take my kid to school or whatnot. And then I fully am embracing the business from 8.30 on to three o'clock. Okay. In meetings most days, everything's scheduled for me, booked. Um, I'm really focused on creating content as well as being amplifying the brand. Mm-hmm. Um, so this stuff as well as speaking, mm-hmm. webinars. Um, usually I fly and do more public speaking, but with this pandemic here in Canada, we're still on like lockdown and same. a lot of things are not the same <laughs> how it used to. Um, but it's actually been very fortunate for me because I spend more time with my children and family. And that's something that is invaluable in life, right? And I love just being present here. Um, so after three o'clock, I don't touch my phone. I don't ch- check emails, n- no social media. I stay disconnected until wow. next following day. So I'm very organized in the sense that I get things done when I need to get done. Yep. Everything else doesn't matter. To me weekends i am completely disconnected and off the grid um like because it's been eight years right like i invested a lot of times and struggled over many years right now i'm comfortable to say if it's that urgent if the if a business website is that like if they're a problem or whatever it can wait mm-hmm. a team member will take care of it if it's that urgent right mm-hmm. but don't message me or call me mm-hmm. unless it's like absolute life or death situation. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. So you have to have parameters and you have to set boundaries. Right. And mm-hmm. that's what I've done with uh, business and life. Wow. I, I'm jealous. That's something that I strive to do to take weekends off or nights off. I'm not there yet. It's a dream of mine, but I'm well, not there yet. Well, that's why you build something, right? Yeah. You build it to suit your life. Yeah. Style, right. Yeah. Life. And you just have to have that vision and goal in mind, right? Mm-hmm. Like everything you structure should be for that pivotal moment mm-hmm. of the shift. And everything I do now is because I enjoy doing it. Mm-hmm. Everything else that I don't like, I already have people in place. You to delegated do it. Stuff, yep. Yep. Right? That's very and smart. It just takes time to do all that. And it doesn't happen overnight. And yep. resources is a big thing. Revenue, sales, profit. Yep. When you don't have that, then it's hard. Yep. But when you start building a buffer, then you can maybe pay a little little bit less to yourself and you're okay with it because it gives you, allows you more freedom to do things that you actually enjoy doing. Mm, Right. mm -hmm. And to bring on other people who can take off some of the burden of things that you don't enjoy doing. Exactly. So the who, not how is a huge, uh, Ah, book that I, the book that he's pointing to for our audio (laughs) listeners. He's got a wall of books behind him, everybody. So it's, it's fabulous. Many of the books I know, but who, not how is, is new. I haven't read that one. Yeah, Dan Sullivan's a, okay. a good uh, coach that talks about like, you know, if you want to scale and grow your business, yep. focus on why you're doing it and, you know, plug in people yep. that love their tasks and roles, right? And just do things you enjoy doing. Absolutely. So one of the interesting things that you've touched on, obviously the pandemic, there's two points that I want to get into here, but the pandemic has changed everything. You mentioned that you went door to door with local businesses. You said things like pizzerias and, you know, maybe a chiropractor or a dentist. One could say that these are the businesses who have been impacted arguably the most by the pandemic. Has that changed because your clients are these physical service-based businesses? Yes, definitely. Um, Most of them has been impacted because of shutdown, right? And it's out of their control. The challenge is, you know, when when the government mandates that Doors can't be open, mm-hmm. and or restricts the amount of people that can come into the store. Um, revenue is not the same. People they hire is not the same. Like they still have very huge amounts of rent costs and supply and product costs and inventory costs, people costs. So for me, I I'm very grateful for a lot of our clients because they know that how important we play a role in their business. So they haven't really shed us as a vendor. They knew how important we are because we're updating things for them yeah. all the time, right? Yeah. Keeping their clients abreast on what's going on, keeping them still top of mind. And when things open up again, at least they're 
optimize for all the major terms and search volume of people that are actively seeking out the service and product, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I felt like building that strong relationship with all these businesses allowed me to sustain the business that I'm running as well as building a stronger relationship with the clients because I'm being vulnerable, they're being vulnerable, and we get each other, right? We're going through the same challenges as a business owner. Yep. Um, so I'm, I'm fortunate to be not just in the digital space, but supporting the small businesses by adding more value than ever, right? Yep. And doing things differently, like understanding the trends, understanding the environment everyone's living through today. Mm -hmm. And it's changed the user behavior as well. Mm -hmm. So we're always shifting like, Keywords, even mm -hmm. understanding the the actual nuances of what's going on in a daily basis for their business, and then adjusting the campaign so that it reflects the results as well. Mm -hmm. And so, I guess twenty twenty was it was okay for you. You didn't have any major. I mean, knock on wood, of course, but uh, you you got through it relatively okay. Yeah, and we're very fortunate. I didn't have to lay any staff off. Wonderful. Um, Everyone is still fully employed. Um, I still have the same drive and passion more than ever, actually, because I know the impact these business owners have had, right? Like, imagine 20 years running a small business and then next you know, month having zero revenue or something, right? Like, you put your hard, your life, like every hour, waking hour to to the business and then the government just shuts everything down, yeah. right? And you can only have so much buffer, a three, six month buffer in terms of your life expenses. And outside of that, you know, you don't even know if you want to continue working or not, right? So how do you continue having that, that mindset of desire of keep doing what you're doing? Are you booked out or do you feel, uh, are you always looking for more clients, always looking to grow? Or do you feel like I'm just going to reach a certain number of clients and then that's it and just work with them? Uh, usually what we've been focused on is really refining to f make sure that they're a good fit for both parties. So yes, we take on clients, we get a lot of leads, we get, um, you know, we do outreach sometimes, but for us, it's more about making sure that there's values that are in place and are aligned and expectations, what they're after is aligned with what the services that we offer are. Um, and the more you do that, the more, you know, mistakes that you made over the years to pick, uh, take on the wrong clients or making sure that, you know, the expectations are out of whack or not. Mm -hmm. Um, even with the sales approach, like myself, I'm more about the branding, making sure that it's amplified to get more exposure in a global scale, um, versus, you know, doing the day-to-day -day sales, uh, presentations. Yep. Um, so I have a team that does that. And for me, it's more about overseeing to make sure that everyone's still going through this whole, it's more like the big machine, right? It's like yeah. making that sure that everything's still going smoothly. And therefore, I'm. we always take on new clients. We always enjoy vetting them to make sure that they know what they're getting. And there's agencies all over the world. And there's good ones and bad. There's ones that specialize on certain niches and they have their own systems and processes. We try to just be unique in the sense that we do things a little bit differently. We're boutique in the sense that we actually care about small, medium-sized businesses and we try to add as much value as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's setting yourself up by understanding what your differentiations are and your interest and your passion is all about. Absolutely. And and I think this is a really important point to touch on, the vetting of clients. And there's another follow-up to that as well. But So when you're vetting a client, what is it that makes a good client and what is it that makes a bad client? Oh, so there's a lot of nuances on it. Um, probing is a big thing. So asking why you need an SEO company, what have you tried, what what's your budget like? We I always need it, just I need it, it to make a million dollars tomorrow. Go. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, right? So understanding what their KPIs are and what their expectations are. Mm -hmm. Realistic or not, what kind of business are they? What have they done before? Who have they worked with before? Why did it didn't work? Why did what did they like or what they didn't like? And then 
it's all asking them because they're going to, mm-hmm. you know, tell you everything, right? And this is the thing about sales. You really get to absorb their, if, if they're a good fit or not, right? Mm-hmm. To see if, I, I think we can work with someone like this or they're very, you know, they a hand-holding. Someone that is going to email you every single day, call you every single day, like micromanage every single process and dictate how you should be doing your campaign. Mm-hmm. You want yep. someone like that, even though you're, they're hiring you as an expert. Right. So you're going to learn. You're going to make a lot of mistakes when you're starting any business. And as you get more mature in your business, you'll kind of have avatars of your ideal type of client, right? And then you kind of create content on your website to just propel to position yourself as a leader for who you want to resonate with. Um, but it, it's fun, right? Like mm-hmm. this whole journey is, yes, you're going to make mistakes and then you're going to have to fire people. And yes, you got to hire again. And yes, you're going to fire again. But that's a part of life, right? If you don't mm-hmm. fall, how do you know if you've done something right or wrong? Mm. It's failures, right? So true. So true. Yeah, vetting is incredibly important because that you know you have to find a good fit Otherwise, and and because it's a field that so few people know about or that, you, like you said, people are still kind of figuring out, nobody really knows what to expect of something like hiring an SEO agency or a digital agency. I find that younger people who are more web savvy, tech savvy, tend to have more realistic expectations about the length of time, you know, why they should invest in these things. Maybe it's a blanket generalization, but that's something that I've noticed. That they're more aware so there, that it's, it's a long game, that it might take years to position yourself and that that's okay. And that there's a reason to invest in this kind of long-term brand building. Yeah, like I feel people that understand how to run a business have real business savvy um, expectations. And if you're new in business, you read a blog, you saw a social post, and you think you can make $100,000 in a month, mm-hmm. right? And so that's their expectation running a business. Mm-hmm. But they have no idea what it takes, how to do it, who's done it before, because that person is just selling a course, right? So, you know, yes, generalizations are there, but I would say make sure that these people who you want to work with are in alignment in terms of like knowledge, skill set, and expectations. Like, yep they know how hard it was for them to get started, mm-hmm. to get build their business, get customers, to, to generate revenue, to have sustainability, lifetime value, customers, retention, loyalty, all that stuff. Um, it, it's so important to just be in alignment. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things, so there, obviously there's a lot of crappy SEO agency, tons. <laughs> like I said, they message you, I'm sure, every day. They message me every day. They message every business owner every day. Every business owner in e-commerce or who has any kind of web presence gets a thousand of the same kind of emails every day. Um, And obviously, most people are focused on what I would consider to be the mid-range of digital marketing results. So they'll tell you something like, give me three to six months because it takes more than a few months to get results going. But then there is a giant question mark when it comes to what happens after six months or after a year other than just keep giving me money, right? So how do you think about the long game where let's say you've been working with a client for a year or two years, and maybe you got all of your early wins that came from, you know, you've done all the optimizations, you've, you've done all of the big things, and you've seen the results, you've built the links, all of that. How do you sustain this, as Simon Sinek says, for the infinite game, the ongoing yeah. game of digital marketing, where um, do, do you find that you have an internal expectation of the line is always going up and to the right or are there some dips? Like what is your and your client's expectation in terms of results, monetary results? Yeah, I always say organic growth mm. is it compounds mm. once you have momentum, mm. right? Um, and traction. So it takes time for you to build it. At the beginning, it's going to take a little bit longer. But as you continue on with anything, right? It's habits. And you still keep adding more content that gets amplified, shared, liked, commented. And then you build some organic traffic through PR press links and, you know, media mentions or associated speaking. The stuff like that, it takes time to build yourself up 
as a leader. And so even retention on a level of your clients' expectations, right? Just let them know. First year, first six months is just to get to know each other, right? We're just starting this relationship. Clients stay with us for five, 10 years, right? And they still stay with us because we're an extension to their business. So mm-hmm. it's a sales technique and process. Mm-hmm. I feel like the family thing that I always talk about is what resonates with people because people want to do business with with someone they can trust, right? And yep. connect with yep. on a more personal level. And if you can do that on your sales pitch, yep. as well as like the relationships you've built with all your clients and these references that you can share to others, they'll see what you're talking about because other people are going to be your biggest advocates. When you send that reference out, they call them up, they're going to sell them for sell them for you, right? Yep. Because they've had such a great experience working with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay, well, I want to sh- shift gears a little bit. So we, we touched on the pandemic, how it affects other people. Well, I think you're the same way for the last eight years, at least. But I have been a remote worker and a remote business owner for pretty much as long as I can remember my entire professional career, at least at least 10, maybe 15 years at this point, I have built businesses remotely. So for me, it's, it's, it's normal. I've always been typing on the computer and a lot of people have been discovering in the pandemic what it's like to be working remotely. And I think we've seen this wave where in the beginning, people were really happy. They're watching Game of Thrones reruns all day. They're like, I'm working from mm-hmm. home, you know, but then later, six months in, their attitude is changing somewhat. They're thinking like, I'm lonely, I'm bored. And this is stuff that I've been telling people for years for way before the pandemic, because people say, oh, I'm so, I'm so jealous that you work remotely or you work from home. And I say, well, you know, it's not all good. There are some major advantages that are great that I personally love and freedoms that I really don't want to live without. But isolation, loneliness, self-motivation, I mean, you touched on it yourself. You have to wake up at 5. All of these things you are dictating to yourself. The mental fortitude to get up at 5 a.m., to read a book every day, to meditate every day before breakfast, that's on you. And I don't think people have understood the enormous pressure to set up these habits for yourself in an environment where nobody will, where nobody's going to tell you if you watch a Netflix episode or if you focus on getting a client. So how do you feel about working remotely as a profession? Is it something you enjoy? Do you get lonely? Do you get bored? Or none of those things? Uh, So... I, I worked in corporate environment for 10 plus years. Mm-hmm. Um, but at, at the time at Yellow Pages, I was actually fortunate to um, have a home office as well. And I spent a lot of those years at home as well. So I was already slowly transitioning it to it. And it allowed me to, you know, have a lot of side hustles as well. It allowed you a lot of freedom to do a lot of different things, right? Like online gaming or whatever it is, right? Um, so it all depends on how you allocate your time, mm. what's important and how important is the social aspect of the daily interactions that you have with people, right? Not just your clients, your staff with humans, right? Mm. Like if you love going to coffee shops and going for lunch and having surrounded with hundreds of other people, then home base is going to be the biggest challenge in your life Oh yeah, because of your social Beast, right? You, right? you love that social interaction. But it also means, you know, dedication and de- commitment to have these processes in place. Like people that were social creatures then doing home base, they're struggling Hard. because 30 years, 20 years of doing this on a daily basis. And they look forward to socializing with people on the go train or bus or whatever, on, on the commute, listening to radio and all that stuff. To then not have that, it's now a new habit they they have to form, right? Um, So for me, it fits my lifestyle because I prefer spending it with my family when I'm able to. And my staff, I can still jump on Zoom calls. And yes, now we can't meet in person. Usually we try to meet like a couple of times a month, even if it's coffee, restaurant, or whatever, get-togethers, uh, and then usually a, a team event, right, with everyone once a year. We, we fly everyone and gather and have a good night, like a week together, uh, bonding. So we still have that, but it's hard for a lot of people, especially if they're younger 
and they don't know any different. Mm. Do you so con- this is all new. Do you consider yourself an introvert or an extrovert? Extrovert, for sure. Extrovert. Okay, that, see, that's an interesting. So you're an extrovert, but you feel comfortable in this arrangement. Yeah, because like, even though I spend a lot of time at home, I love going to coffee shops. I love going for walks. Mm-hmm. I go to the park with my son all the time. Yep. I love going shopping, grocery shopping, because there's no real <laughs> shopping anymore. Uh, <laughs> But these are things that I, I en- actually breaks up my day, right? To do things, get out, um, you know, and just have fresh air, right? Go out and see other people. Yep. Have real lives, right? Yep. Not just staying in front of a computer. No, that's, that's the thing. It's so, so important. Um, well, I, uh, I want to get into a couple rapid fire questions as we approach the end of this. I want to be mindful of your time, but thank you for being honest and for sharing everything so far. Very insightful. Um, so the big question, if you can give me a quick sub one minute answer to this question, anybody who's looking to become a digital agency owner or an SEO professional, what advice would you have? Who's thinking about following in your footsteps? Again, people go through a different um, spectrum of their career path, right? And being a business owner, mindset is a huge thing. You were an employee before, or you have a passion, right? Side hustle to turn to entrepreneur. You got to figure out if this is for you or not. So first thing is making having clarity on what your vision is. Why do you want to be a business owner? Do you not follow orders? Do you like dealing with customers? Do you want more headaches than you think? You, <laughs> like people don't understand the, the realm of running a business. There's so many other factors that get involved in learning about management, operations, HR, accounting, bookkeeping, sales, marketing, so many things you got to learn. Um, so be prepared for that, a huge learning curve. Then it's like one skill set I'm so lucky to have had was sales. Mm-hmm. Like listening to people, talking to people and resonating with them, connecting so that they understand that I'm really wanting to help them. I'm not settling. I want to really provide value. I want to partner with them so that they see what we're all about, right? Like sales is an art, I felt. And, you know, 10 years of doing it and best training, going to read and conferences and learning from some of the top sales people in Canada, I've been able to have that skill set. And that's one gap I would say a lot of people don't have really strong strengths as, as a business owner. Okay. If you cannot sell to your customers, you're going to have the hardest challenge trying to sell, like getting a sales rep to sell for you mm. because you should be the biggest advocate of your agency, your product or service. If you can't sell it, then good luck trying to hire someone to sell it for you. Mm-hmm. All right. What's your uh, favorite sales book? Uh, man, Zig Ziglar's had tons of books. Um, Brian Tracy was another one. Man, I, I started reading sales 20 years ago. So I, I don't even remember don't those. Remember. Okay, but it's ingrained in Because <laughs> I don't really do this okay. sales yeah. as much anymore. So all right. it's all about like marketing and branding and all that other stuff. How do you find uh, physical conferences, pandemic aside, to go to that are worthwhile and so, not scams? So the big thing for me is making sure I do a strategic decision on the, the speakers who's running it and what the purpose is on the topics that they're going to be pitching and presenting. And then I look at who's going to be attending that I want to connect with. So I feel like the off hours of not just going to the presentations, but networking amongst the peers who are attendees are much more valuable. So if there's a way, a breakout session or people that you're actually in a a group table format where you get to meet your peers, that's, who you want to connect with more so. And that's the value you get from meeting real people, Mm. right? Um, Going through the same challenges that you have. And that's why you're at this conference to absorb content from the thought leaders, right? So it's still valuable. um, But I do less of that now because I'm already connected in many other communities and speaking tours and stuff. So for me, it's more like you just have to figure out strategically where your gaps are. And maybe a coach and mentor can also guide you faster as well. Um, so just understand where you're at and where you want to be. Okay, great. What's your favorite book of all the books behind you in general? 
Oh man. Um, so rich, that uh, think and grow think rich. And grow by the yeah, always good. Read that many um, times. Yep. Uh, I I'm a big Adam Grant guy, so give and take is great. Okay. Um, Originals is another one. Um, I there's so many books, so it all depends on what topic I would say. Okay. Because right? there's health, which is <laughs> eat nutrition. I love that. Right. Uh, then there's like habits right and there's atomic habits and all these yep, uh, you got that one jefferson peterson like there's all <laughs> these other ones um and then there's search and then there's marketing and branding and then i'm into like real estate investing i'm uh, into crypto uh, i'm into like investing and learning right like life um i was big into you know again online gaming, <laughs> online anything, right? Gambling. I was learning all that and I was having fun. So I would read to try to beat people. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Just having fun with it all because there's people that have spent so much time building a, an audience, building a book and spending so many hours build, writing it that they've already have some intelligence and strategic uh, topics that you can absorb in there that you can gauge for your own interest and you mm. utilize for your own purpose, right? So good. I love it, man. I, I feel, I think we have a lot more in common than we're able to talk about in this, <laughs> in this chat. I'm right there with you. I think it's all related. I read, I only read nonfiction books myself. Um, I read a ton. Also focus on meditation of those that health food, I'm vegetarian, yeah. um, you know, all of these things are, I think there's a lot of overlap there. Um, I want to give two things to you to the floor to wrap this up. The first is, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Uh, so my mom is, I think, the biggest inspiration in my life. Um, my, my parents left the Vietnam War, and I was the fourth child of them coming here. I was the only one born in Canada. So they sacrificed everything to escape the war, to come to and immigrate here. And, you know, just to do that, right? To have the courage to leave everything behind, to come to Canada, not knowing the language and not knowing, having money. Like they, they came broke, right? And we had to start from nothing. Just doing. And I was always in the, you know, mindset of being a good human. Like values is everything, right? Giving to others, people that are, never at the same stage. Like we were not the, you know, we were government housing. We needed support and a lot of that. So we, we got a lot of from Salvation Army and food banks. And now I'm at the ability to give back to that. Right. And it's so rewarding to then go for full circle. Right. Mm -hmm. They're having, you know, choice and abundance to give back at the beginning. I didn't have choice. I was like, this is all we have shelter and food mm -hmm. and each other. So let's make the most of it. So living for the purpose of being a good human, I think. And, you know, that's what my mom taught me, right? She was always volunteering, even though she didn't even know the language. She knew there were other people in the same situation from different cultures and new immigrants that needed support. So she was a part of just helping them get accustomed to the community, right? And that's where now I spend a lot of time mentoring people that are new to Canada. I, I do things because I love it and I feel like there's a lot of people that are in need and if you can give back time or resources or whatever you can, do it because it's so rewarding. Mm -hmm. All right. well, that's a fabulous answer. I wholeheartedly agree. And the very, very final thing here is where can people find you or if they're interested in working with you, please give your info. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Ross. Um, my personal website, so very similar to Ross, we do SEO. Um, it's called localseosearch.ca, based in Toronto, Canada. Uh, we service clients all over North America, um, UK and Australia. And we also have a podcast similar to yours, but it's called Local SEO Today. And it's just a lot of fun. I get to interview people that I admire and want to speak to and have different conversations. And just like what we're having, and it's fun. The, that's what we do for a living. You got to balance your life, right? You can't always be serious. You got to enjoy what you're doing. And this is something I admire from every producer of a podcast or, you know, any, you know, big, huge conference or anything, because it's so much time and effort to put this together. 
at least you're doing it and doing something about it. Like every entrepreneur, you're taking action. And that's what it's all about. Someone that's committing to take action has a lot more to lose, but so much more to win, right? Mm. And therefore, it's so admirable for what you've done. And I'm so thankful for you to have me on your show today. Well, it was my my pleasure. Thank you for that. Um, absolutely a pleasure talking with you. I wish you nothing but success. Thank you so much for lending me your time and your ideas and your insights. I hope that people do check you out. Um, I think it's fascinating. You seem you seem to be doing very well on the being a good human scale. So <laughs> I think I think yeah, it's it's been fabulous. So uh, with that, the podcast is officially over. Thanks for listening to the Beat the Often Path podcast. If you've been enjoying this show, please like, comment, share, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, subscribe to me on YouTube. It would mean the world to me. Also, do you have an unusual success story or do you know someone who does? Well, please recommend them to me. They could be a future guest on this show. Maybe they've rolled the largest boulder down the mountains of Tibet, or maybe they built the world's largest chicken farm in Madagascar. The point is, I don't know what I don't know, so I'm looking for inspiration and unusual success stories. So help me by being a part of this adventure. I'm looking to grow this podcast with you. Thanks again for listening.